Now let's look at a simple example. We have a data set with 37 candy bars and their nutritional facts such as calories, fat, protein, and carb. To simplify the problem, let's only focus on two of the nutritional facts, fat and the protein, for now. If we plot the data for fat and the protein using a scatter plot, using fat as x1 and the protein as x2, we get the scatter plot at the bottom of this slide. Do you see a pattern in the data points? You have probably noticed a positive correlation between fat and the protein. As fat increases, protein also increases. As we discussed, correlation between variables indicate information overlap, suggesting that the information that is in the fat variable is repeated in the protein variable and vice versa. Now, our goal is to reduce dimensions. With only two variables, the only data set with less dimensionality would be a one-dimensional data set with only one variable. And that would mean removing either the fat or protein variable from the data set. Is this a viable solution? If it is, which variable should we remove? Well, to answer these questions, we need to first understand what information means in a data set. Information is defined as variation or variance in the data. Now imagine that you have a very large data set with millions of observations. But if all the values you have in the data set are zeros, do you have any information in this data set? No, there is no information in that data set. The same would be true if the only values in the data set are ones or any other number for the matter, because there is no variation or variance in the data set. Only when data varies, it shows patterns and the relationships. We can measure the amount of information in a variable using the measurement variance, which is computed as the sum of squared difference between the value and the mean, divided by the number of values. We can get the variance or the measurement of information in fat and protein by creating the covariance matrix for these two variables in Excel. The data analysis menu in Excel allows you to create a covariance matrix as the one shown here. Covariance refers to the joint variability of two variables. In other words, it is the variance in one variable that is repeated in the variance of another variable. The off-diagonal numbers in the covariance matrix are the variances for the two variables. For example, the variance for fat is 45.46 and the variance for protein is 4.90. The number 11.70 is the covariance. We can convert the covariance number into correlation using the formula 
covariance divided by the square root of the product of the two variance values. Correlation is an index that ranges from negative 1 to positive 1. The closer the value is to negative 1 or positive 1, the stronger the correlation. As you can see, the correlation between fat and the protein is calculated to be 0 0.78, which signals strong positive correlation between the two variables. This further confirms what we saw in the scatter plot earlier. High correlation suggests that there is a high degree of information overlap between fat and protein. Now, if variance is the measure of information, then the total amount of information that fat and the protein contain is the sum of the two variance values, 45.46 plus 4.9, or 50.36 and the fat accounts for 45.46 divided by 50.36 or 90.27 percent of the total information and the protein accounts for 9.73 percent of the total information now return to our earlier questions can we remove one of the variables? And which variable should we remove? Well, the answer is quite clear now. We can remove the variable protein because it is the variable that contains less information than the other variable. And by removing the variable protein, we are losing about 10% of the total information that is in the two variables. Now, is there a better solution than simply removing the variable protein and lose 10% of the information? 10% of the information seems to be a pretty large portion of the total information. Can we achieve the same reduction in dimensionality without losing that much information? Well, to answer these questions, we need to think about this problem slightly differently. If variance is the measure of information in data, then the question we should be asking is how can we redistribute the information or variance in the data set in a more polarized way so that one dimension would account for an even larger portion of the variance, while the other dimension would account for only a very small amount of the variance. Let's look at the scatter plot again. We can visualize the variance or variability of the data on different dimensions in the scatter plot. As you can see, the variability of the data in X1 fat is from here to here. And the variability of the data in X2 protein is from here to here. Well, is there another direction where we see even larger variability in data? What about the direction of the diagonal line here? Do we see more variability in data along this direction? The direction of the diagonal line shows a very large variability, one that's larger than both x1 and x2. What about the direction that is orthogonal to the direction of the diagonal line? Well, it has a variability that is smaller than both x1 and x2. Now let's show you a cleaner version of this diagram in the next slide. 
Here is a cleaner version of the diagram with two new dimensions marked on the scatter plot. The first one, the diagonal line with the largest variability in data is labeled PC1 or principal component 1. And the other dimension, which is orthogonal to PC1 with the smallest variability in data is labeled PC2 or principal component 2. The new dimensions have redistributed the variance in the data in a more polarized way. PC1 captures a very large portion of the variance, whereas PC2 captures the rest and also a very small portion of the variance. Since PC1 and PC2 are tilted, it is a little awkward to look at them. Now let's rotate them along with the data points clockwise so that PC1 and PC2 would coincide with the X and the Y axis. Now by rotating PC1 and PC2 along with the data points, we get the diagram in this slide. Keep in mind, we are still looking at exactly the same data. We are simply looking at them from a different vantage point. Now PC1 and PC2 are the new x-axis and the y-axis. By projecting the data points onto PC1 and PC2, we get new coordinates for these data points. And these new coordinates are the values for our new variables, PC1 and PC2. Before we get into these values, let's first look at the distribution of the information between PC1 and PC2. I have asked Excel to compute the covariance matrix for PC1 and PC2 for me, and shown it here next to the diagram. As you can see, the variance for PC1 is now 48.60 and the variance for PC2 is now 1.76. And the covariance is so small, it is almost zero. As a result, the correlation between PC1 and PC2 would also be so small, it's almost zero, suggesting that there is no correlation between PC1 and PC2. If you add the variance values together, we get the total variance or total amount of information of 50.36. Recall from the previous slides, the total variance of fat and the protein was also 50.36. And this shows that by converting them to PC1 and PC2, we have not lost any information or variance that was in the original variables. Now let's take a look at the distribution of the information or variance. Now PC1 accounts for 96.51% of the total information, whereas PC2 only accounts for 3.49% of the total information. So as you can see here, the information has been redistributed in a much more polarized way than before. If we now decide to reduce the dimensionality of the data by discarding PC2, we will only lose about 3.5% of the total information versus almost 10% if we simply discarded the protein variable. Now let's summarize what we have learned so far from this example. First, by converting the original variables fat and protein to the new variables PC1 and PC2, the total amount of information measured by variance remains the same. We did not lose any information by doing this 
because we are simply looking at the same data from a different vantage point. It is like instead of watching a movie being filmed in front of you in three dimensions, versus watching the same movie on the screen in two dimensions. You are not losing any information. Instead, information has been redistributed in a more polarized way. Now PC1 contains most of the information, whereas PC2 contains the rest and only a very small portion of the information. One thing you probably have already noticed is that the two original variables can be converted into two principal components to represent all the information in the original dataset. So the number of principal components generated from, PC, from PCA would be the same as the number of original variables, except that the variance has been redistributed in a more polarized way to make removing those new variables that account for little information easier. If we discard PC2 and only use PC1 in subsequent analysis, we would only lose less than 3.5% of the information versus losing almost 10% of the information if we decide to remove the variable protein. Finally, PC1 and the PC2 are uncorrelated, so there is no information overlap between the two variables. Recall that fat and the protein had a very high correlation, which is not desirable in model development. Do you now see how principal component analysis reduces dimensionality without losing much information? You may be wondering what are the values of the new variables PC1 and PC2, also called the principal component scores, computed. As we mentioned before, it was done using a technique called eigen decomposition, which is beyond the scope of this class. The computer software would provide you with the eigenvectors, or in layperson's term, weights, for converting the original values for fat and the protein to new values for PC1 and PC2. In this slide, I'm showing two tables side by side, one with the original values, and the other one with the converted values for PC1 and the PC2. The table in blue here shows you the eigenvectors or the weights. To compute the values for PC1, the weight for fat is negative 0.97 and the weight for protein is negative 0.26. To compute the value for PC2, the weight for fat is 0.26 and the weight for protein is negative 0.97. There are two formulas for computing the values for principal components, one for standardized values and another for unstandardized values. In this example, since we did not standardize the value prior to PCA, we will use the first formula here. to compute the values for PC1 and PC2. For standardized values, the formula requires that you get the mean or average of the original variable. So the mean for fat is 9.73, and the mean for protein is 2.78. Now we are ready to compute the PC1 values. For example, the original fat and the protein values are 6.5 and 1.5, respectively, for the first candy bar, three musketeers. So all we need to do is plugging in the numbers into our formula.
if you do the calculation, you will get exactly 5.70, which is the PC1 value for three musketeers computed by the computer software. If you are using standardized values, such as z-score, then you will use the second formula, which simply multiplies the weight by the standardized value. Fortunately, the software will do all the calculations for you, as I will show you in software demonstration later. So what we discussed about how PCA works can be also generalized to more than two dimensions that you saw in our example. We can apply PCA to the entire data set for the candy bars with four variables, calories, fat, protein, and the carb. One thing to keep in mind is that if variables are measured using different scales, variables with larger scales tend to have an oversized inference on the principal component scores. Therefore, it is recommended that variables be standardized prior to PCA. How to convert variable values into z-scores has been discussed in another lecture related to distance measures. So please feel free to refer to that lecture. Another key concept to remember is that the number of principal components generated is the same as the number of original variables. In other words, if you start with four variables, as in the candy bar dataset, the maximum number of principal components that will be generated will also be four. However, you may not end up using all four principal components, because if you do, you're not achieving any reduction in data dimensionality. You may decide to only use two of the principal components, because they already account for a very large portion of the information or variance in the original data set. If you decide to retain only two of the four principal components, which two would you keep? Well, this is related to the next key concept of PCA you need to remember. All principal components are automatically ordered by the percentage of variance they account for in descending order. That means that the first principal component accounts for more variance than the second principal component, and the second principal component accounts for more variance than the third principal component, and so on. So you only need to retain the first few principal components in order to retain the most information in the original variables. So to answer our question, among the four principal components, you will retain the first two principal components, PC1 and PC2, if you decide to only keep two variables for subsequent analysis. Finally, all principal components are uncorrelated, meaning that there is no information overlap between the variables. This helps avoid multicollinearity problems in regression and improve model stability. Now let's take a quick look at the PCA output for the candy bar dataset with four variables to see if all the key concepts of PCA that we just discussed check out. As you can see, from the four variables, PCA generates four principal components, PC1, PC2, PC3, and PC4. The third column of the output shows the percent of variance each principal component accounts for. For example, PC1 accounts for 67.07% of the total variance, and PC2 accounts for 26.86% of the total variance. And collectively, they already account for 
0.92% of all the information in the original variables. The cumulative variance percentages are reported in the last column. The second column reports the eigenvalues. So what is an eigenvalue? Eigenvalues also tells you how much variance each principal component explains, but in a slightly different format. Here's how to interpret it. Since there are four variables of four principal components, suppose on average each variable contains one unit of information, then four variables would have a total of four units of information. As the output shows that the first principal component accounts for 67.07% of the total information. 4 times 67.07% gives us 2.68, which represents 2.68 units of information. So as you can see, eigenvalues essentially tell you the same information as percentage of variance explained. You can also see that the principal components are sorted in terms of the percentage of variance they explain, or eigenvalues, in descending order. This makes it easier for us to decide how many principal components to retain for subsequent analysis. For example, if we want to reduce the dimensionality of the data, but at the same time retain at least 90% of the information in the original variable, we would keep the first two principal components, because collectively they account for 93.92% of the information, which is greater than 90%. This is a great segue to our next topic, which is how do we know how many principal components we should retain? Let's explore this question in the next slide. There is no definitive rule for deciding how many principal components to retain, but there are some guidelines. First, the analyst can determine the proportion of variance that the principal components must explain. It can be an arbitrary number, like 70%, 80%, or 90%, or any other percentage that you see fit. This can be easily implemented because, as you saw in principal component analysis results, all principal components are sorted based on the amount of variance they explain. If you look at the PCA output, at the bottom left corner of this slide. If we decide that we must retain at least 70% of the information in our principal components, then we would retain only the first two principal components because collectively they account for about 75% of the total information. However, if we must retain 80% of the information, then we will have to keep all three principal components. If that is the case, then we should simply use the original variables, unless you need the variables to be uncorrelated with each other. The second guideline, one that is widely used not only for PCA, but fact analysis as well, is the eigenvalue greater than one rule, which suggests that we will only retain the principal components with a greater than one eigenvalue. The idea is that if the principal component accounts for less than one unit of information, which is the average amount of information each original variable should have, then we are better off using the original variable than the principal component because the original variable would account for more information. Again, using the example below, we would keep the first two principal components using this rule because the third principal component has an eigenvalue of 0 0.75, which is less than 1. 
The third guideline is to use the screen plot, which is at the bottom right corner of this slide. The screen plot visually displays the eigenvalues. In the screen plot, we would try to identify an elbow-shaped location to determine the number of principal components to retain. In our example, our elbow-shaped location appears about here, which is where the second principal component is. So it suggests that we should keep two principal components. The idea is that if an elbow appears in a screen plot, it means that cumulatively, the rest of the principal components will not account for a lot of variance. Like I said, there is no definitive rule for this decision, only guidelines. Finally, let's talk about the strengths and weaknesses of PCA. Let's start with the strengths. First, the principal components are uncorrelated, which is a desirable attribute of the data for model building. Second, PCA sorts the principal components by the amount of variance they account for, making it easy for us to identify the principal components to retain for subsequent analysis. Third, we can often achieve significant reduction in dimensionality through PCA, and at the same time retain most of the information that is in the original dataset. Finally, the concept of PCA has also been applied to other fields, such as text mining. PCA is a very powerful dimension reduction tool and has many practical applications in business analytics, but we also need to be aware of its limitations. First, the resulting principal components are not interpretable. They are simply weighted linear combinations of the original variables. Imagine you are trying to develop a linear regression model to predict housing values using predictive variables such as square footage of the house, number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, and whether it has been remodeled within the last five years. If you use the original predictive variables to build your regression model, you will be able to interpret the impact of the predictive variables on the target variable house value. However, if you use principal components to build the regression model, then the regression model is not going to be interpretable because the regression model is going to use the principal components as its independent variables. Therefore, if your goal is to build a predictive model, then PCA would be fine. But if part of your goal is to interpret the model, then PCA would make the model impossible to interpret therefore would not be a good solution. You will have to use other dimension reduction techniques, such as variable clustering, instead. Second, as we discussed, there is no definitive rule for deciding how many principal components to keep, so analysts tend to struggle with this decision when using PCA. It may take a lot of trial and error to get the number of principal components right for your modeling purpose. Third, although PCA can significantly reduce the number of variables, it does not create any cost savings in data collection. The reason is that to compute the principal component scores, you still need the values from all the original variables because each principal component is the weighted linear combination of all the original variables. If you want to reduce the effort in data collection, then PCA is not right for you. Finally, the eigenvectors or weights for computing principal component scores are often misinterpreted by analysts. Eigenvectors are simply weights, so it is usually better to leave them unexplained. As you can see, while PCA is a very powerful and popular dimension reduction technique, it has some serious limitations. 
the lack of interpretability is especially problematic in many situations. Now that you understand how PCA works, let's work on a problem. In this data set, we have the country level health and population measures for 38 countries from World Bank's 2000 Health, Nutrition, and Population Statistics Database. For each country, the measures include death rate per 1,000 people, health expenditure per capita, life expectancy at birth, male adult mortality rate per 1,000 male adults, female adult mortality rate per 1,000 female adults, annual population growth, female population, male population, total population, size of the labor force, birth per woman, and birth rate per 1,000 people. As you can imagine, many of these variables are highly correlated. Before we can use these variables to develop predictive models, we need to remove the information redundancy in the data set and the reduced data dimensions. Let's use principal component analysis to reduce the dimensions of this data set while still try to retain at least 90% of the information in the original variables.